So when we put together the conference, you know, one of the things that we really focus on is really on um, leadership and mobility. So as journalists, you know, it's, it's, no, it's no surprise that our industry in many ways are contracting. So our industry is contracting, so a lot of people say, well, where are the jobs? What, what am I supposed to do? Do I have to learn how to do Facebook, social media, programming, video, everything at once? So rather than take the guessing work you know, out of you, I invited um, some of the key speakers here that we have so that they could tell you what is it that they expect from all of you um, when you're looking for a job for a major media organization, you know, whether it is someone um, like the Washington Post or um, the AP or CNN or um, Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Marcus Broccoli. Um, he's the vice president and, um, of Washington Post, formerly the executive editor of not only just the Washington Post, but also the Wall Street Journal, which um, I've worked with Marcus for many years. And then to uh, Marcus' right is Ken Brown. He's the Asia finance editor and also the Hong Kong bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal and, and Dow Jones. And then um, next to Ken is um, Brian Cavallano. He's the um, news director for um, the Asia Pacific region for the Associated Press, um, which means it's not just text, but also video and photography and, and all cross format. And finally, the only lady we have in the panel, um, is Ilana Lee, and she's the Vice President and Managing Editor of CNN International, Asia Pacific. So, you know, again, the purpose of this panel is to really, um, for the news leader to have a chance to really communicate, you know, what is it they expect from their top leadership within the newsroom, and what do they look for in terms of talent, and, and what it means to really lead. And so, I hope you guys will enjoy the panel. I have one. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to be back in Hong Kong, where I lived for many years. Um, as Paul said, uh, these are interesting times in journalism, and to understand what it takes to get a job in journalism, to advance in journalism, to manage a journalism enterprise, these are all good questions, and we have a great panel here who can answer the questions. What I thought I'd do is begin the conversation by just sort of posting, uh, posing a few questions to them and let them serially answer them. And after that, uh, open the floor up to you and your questions and, and you can throw spitballs at them and try and get them to react in an interesting way after they finish with all their um, prepared answers. So, prepared. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the first question, which is the most obvious question, but it's actually not an inconsequential question in, the, in today's world is, what does it actually take to, to get a job in journalism? Particularly, what does it take to get a job in an enterprise like the ones that you work for? Because each of you works for well-known international brands, sort of destination spots for a lot of journalists. What are you looking for uh, in young journalists? And um, what are you finding? Why don't we just go this way and start with Ken? Well. Uh, we uh, at the Journal and, and Dow Jones were in a in a pretty good position because we can really hire um, you know the best most experienced uh, reporters out there and so we're because uh, when we have been in, at least in the U.S. one of the few people who've been hiring um, a lot and you know so what you do is you look at you know you get your your pile of um, of resumes and you just look for standouts um, and certain things stand out. Um, that, you know, fr from the crowd. And so among the things that, you know, I'll look for are, uh, we are the, a financial, broadly a financial publication, you know, people with financial knowledge, people who understand some of the complicated stuff we talk about um, just so that they can, you know, hit the ground running. I look for people uh, with language skills, um, especially out here, but even in the U.S., you know, you think about when you hire someone, you hire someone from a, for one job, but you want them to have a career and for us, a career often and should mean going abroad. So we think about that a lot. And then we look for people. Uh, you know, the other great thing about hiring uh, in journalism is you get to see what people have done. And uh, you know, if I read someone's clips or look, wa you know, look, watch what they send or look at their or their graphics or whatever, and nothing you know knocks me over, 
uh, then you know I, I won't expect it to knock me over when uh, when they're on board. So I look for um, you know just stuff that that I wish we had done. Um, uh, really smart, um, really unique, uh, creative things like that. Hey, Brian, before you before you get into it, um, maybe I can ask you specifically also address the question that Ken sort of raised, which is how do you balance the value of expertise in a subject area? It could be regional expertise, it could be knowing finance or economics, versus journalism, writing, or I guess these days, content production <laughs> skills of some kind, versus in this region, something more narrow, which is language, country knowledge. Well, I think we're, we're probably all fortunate to have reasonably good-sized teams where we can, you know, we can mix and match a lot of those skills. We can make sure that we have the, the regional and the country knowledge, but as everyone knows, there's also a benefit in the newsroom to having what we call fresh eyes on a story or being able to look at a story with uh, the perspective of someone who hasn't been immersed in it for a really long time. So I think building a balance both of skills and expertise and, uh, and knowledge mm -hmm. of a region is important um, and so that you don't end up with a real homogeneous um, population in any of your offices. Um, more broadly to the original question, I mean, it's true we don't hire as many people uh, as we used to, I think, across the industry. And yet, um, when we do have opportunities to hire, we're inundated with fantastic candidates. I mean, it's like, you know, the journalism world is churning out better and uh, more varied skill sets amongst its journalists, I think, than ever before. And so when we do have opportunities to hire, it's an incredibly precious thing that you really don't want to screw up. You want to make sure that you absolutely get you know, the right person who has the right skills for the job that you're filling. And for me, at some foundational level, those skills are actually the same skills that we've always looked for. It's, you know, does this person know how to work a beat and break news if it's a reporting job? Do they have a track record of breaking big stories? Um, you know, those things are, are universal and, you know, the value of the exclusive has probably never been higher than it is now despite all the changes that have happened in our, uh, in our industry over the past uh, 10 years or so. And so, and then you build on top of that and you think about, well, how does this person use all of those, you know, all of these incredible tools that journalists have available to them in order to do those foundational things? Do they know how to use social media in order to mine? Uh, you know, in order to mine a beat, do they, you know, do they know how to do data journalism at some level? Uh, do they have multi-format skills? But those sort of bedrock, bedrock principles of journalism mm -hmm. that we want everybody to have, that actually hasn't really changed, even though the industry has changed in so many ways. Maybe from the television perspective, are things different? No, I, I don't think this perspective is different at all. I think, I mean, I, and the reason I like this uh, panel and I was willing to come on it is because it's it's a it's a big issue of mine. I'm constantly hiring people. Um, and you you know, it takes about a year or two years to figure out if you've hired the right person. But you can literally tell in 72 hours if you've made a mistake. And it's not, it, doesn't, it takes more than 72 hours to get them out the door as well. So hiring is a, a really important uh, part of our process. Uh, I'd say, you know, there are a lot of sm smart people now. I have one of the youngest newsrooms in all of CNN Worldwide here in Hong Kong. We've got a lot of millennials. Some of them are here. Um, and being smart at school, it's, it's a common denominator now. It doesn't get you noticed. What does get you noticed is the type of skills and passions you have. You know, we brought someone on who, um, who's definitely beyond a millennial, but you know, his passion was, for example, Instagram. Very obsessed with Instagram, became one of the most popular followers here in Hong Kong and I'd say in Asia Pacific. And Facebook picked him up. You know, so these kind of passion, when I had a conversation with him, I was able to have a conversation about a new field that maybe I'm not as familiar with. But he brought that type of expertise, you know, to our newsroom. You know, I've got some people here, you know, when we brought Madison over from Atlanta, you know, she spent a lot of time on uh, the medical beat, something that we didn't have here in Hong Kong, so she would add a lot of value to that. You know, Judy speaks three different languages. You know, Alok has a lot of inter uh, interest in Southeast Asia, so he brings those expertise. So, you know, we are like a, you know, in a way we're homogeneous, but we don't want to be homogeneous. We're like a United Nation. So if everyone can bring different skill sets, then that makes us, just, makes us a smarter newsroom. The one thing I would add to that, and the reason we do interviews face-to-face -face as much as possible, whether it's Skype, is because we really need to make sure that their disposition would fit all, our culture. You know, we're not as big as you know we used to be in you know a decade ago, and we're hiring you know tons of people. We have to be really specific on who we hire. We have a fantastic newsroom, 
And if I bring someone in who's not going to get along with that culture, who's not going to pick up and do their, their part, it really stresses a lot of the other overachievers in the newsroom. So we want to make sure they've got, you know, I can teach them the skills. We've got good teachers who can teach them how to put a rundown together, you know, to how to learn our CNN system versus an AP system versus an Al Jazeera system. But I can't teach them the attitude. You have to bring that attitude and you have to be willing to start from the bottom and be willing to do everything. The worst thing probably is someone coming to my office and saying, I'm just not a morning person. <laughs> it's just, you know, none of us wants to do morning shifts. You know, I started doing shifts at one in the morning for three years when I came from New York, and I was literally jet lagged for three and a half years. <laughs> so, you know, you got to come with the attitude that I want to learn. But if you do, the great thing about companies like ours, at least for CNN, is that we will invest in your career and we will invest in your future. So, you know, those are the things that I look for. So, all of these comments. Um, <laughs> sound a, a, a certain curious way. Uh, you're all talking about people coming to you, supplicant-like, you know, hoping to get a job at your organization, this exalted media organization, CNN or AP or the Wall Street Journal, because like everybody wants to work there more than anything in the world. And my experience is that's not actually always the case anymore. In fact, I'm not sure that we're not begging for talent sometimes and competing against organizations we never competed with before to get the best people. So could you talk a little bit about how do you go about finding talent? Because it's not just people showing up at your doorstep. You know, you're, you're up against anybody who does social media. You're up against anybody who has new media. You're up against companies, products that didn't exist five years ago. How do you go about sourcing talent? Um, yeah, I know I've, I've gone up against all that. I've lost, um, I worked in New York for many years and ran a staff there and I lost people to every social media organization, you know, out there, and hired from some, and there was a, a big. Uh, New York is a big sort of media community, so there was a, a, a big, a big flow like that. Um, and one of the things I did when I came out here, um, and I had I had a pool of talent in New York of people I wanted to hire. Uh, I had a dozen people on a list basically that I wanted to hire when the right opening uh, came out, and those were people who I, you know, met over time. You know, uh, either found on my own, they approached me, etc. So they were beating us on stories. Um, my my, when we hired my replacement in New York, um, he was a guy who you know we had competed fiercely against uh, from the FT uh, for for a couple for many years, and uh, you know we were able to bring him in, um, and that was sort of a three-year courtship, uh, and then the right job, which happened to be my job, you know, he took. Um, so it is. Uh, from, from our perspective, we need to show uh, what we can bring to these really smart, talented people. We need to show them, you know, that we're going to give them uh, – the, the biggest thing I get from people when, wanting to come to a place like The Journal is I want to work with a really good editor. I want to get global exposure. I want to do the best work of my career. Um, and I feel like this is a place that uh, will get me there. And so we just need to show them that we can, we can do that. Um, and you know sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, depending on what their their needs are. And um, sometimes the the irony of it is, and, and Marcus knows, you know, from the his old journal days, you know, at the Journal Forever, the uh, pinnacle of of writing and in, and in journalism, Broadway was the page one Wall Street Journal leaders. These you know massive, long, months long, sometimes years long um, investigative stories, features, all that stuff that took forever. And you put it on the front page, and you know you got this great readership and all that stuff, and it was the you know what people strive for, and that's really not the case anymore. I mean, people are very happy to uh, do a project that's um, visual, that's a graphic project, that's an online project that has you know all kinds of different elements. People are interested in doing long-running series that maybe not are one print story, but you know watch an evolving story and have different facets like social media and stuff like that. And we need we need to when there are people we want, we need to show that we can we're a place that we can let them do that, that kind of work. Yeah, I think your point is well taken, Marcus. Um, I've had to hire people both in San Francisco and in what, Charleston, West Virginia for the AP, and I tended to have a lot more candidates for the San Francisco <laughs> jobs than for the West Virginia jobs. So, you know, I think what Ken said is, is important is that the recruiting doesn't start when you have a job to fill. You're constantly looking out there at who are your competitors, who's breaking news, who's... Um, you know, who do you wish uh, that you had on your team and keeping a list of those people and making contact with those people. Um, sometimes at, at gatherings like this one, sometimes just, you know, at news events where something's going on and you, you know, have a quick chat. Um, 
one of the things that, that I run into in recruiting for the AP is just, you know, um, everybody has sort of an impression of every news organization. So if someone has, you know, has a track record of, of doing really long, in-depth investigative stories, um, maybe they still think of AP as the wire service that's sort of just the facts, you know, blah, 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 comma, police said. Um, and, you know, I think managing people's impressions of the organization and what it would be like to, to work there is important. Presenting with them some vision for how you're part of the organization and how the organization in general perceives itself and where it thinks it's headed. Um, but, you know, having a, a group of people who sort of understand what you're trying to accomplish that you can turn to when you have an opportunity to hire is a lot easier than, you know, we just posted a job, oh my gosh, who are we going to hire for this and starting to make frantic calls. So, and I've done both and uh, the, the former is a lot better. Yeah, I'd say it uh, depends on the, you know, there's multiple layers of hiring of, you know, which level you're hiring for. You know, the one thing that me, uh, the my managers, my deputies, and um, we are, uh, we have one remit. I would like to eventually when we hire a writer, for example, or hire an associate producer, we want to hire someone that we believe that could have a progression within our newsroom. We are investing in them, so I would like that writer to eventually want to become a producer or you know, associate producer or segment producer and then move up that ladder and become a producer. I mean, certainly in my case, you know, I started as an AP, so I'm very sensitive to if anybody goes around and gets, you know, gets uh, angry at the person who's prompting, I know what kind of difficult job that is, you know, but so I've had that progression with my company. I like to do the same for who we bring up. But there are other different types of uh, jobs, for example, talent, anchors. That is very difficult. It's, it's one of, you know, there's a reason why I've got like 10 different television monitors in my office. I'm constantly checking to see who's on television, who would be the right fit for CNN. And it's not easy because you're not just teleprompter reading. Um, my boss loves to tell me, are you telling me with one billion population in China, we can't find, you know, the, you know, Christian Amanpour for China, you know? And, you know, it's, it's not only how you look, it's, you know, what you bring to the table are you able to suddenly go from a prompter reading format to suddenly dealing with breaking news in Iraq and then change to why the Nikkei is dropping 7%? It's these kind of skills that we're looking for. So for me, the biggest homework is finding talent. And sometimes I would love to find someone from print they have, because I have a huge respect for people in the print business. But they would need to learn the skills for television, which is fundamentally very, very different than television. And what we're trying to do for CNN Money, for a lot of those out there looking for jobs, and I hear you have a job fair after this, we've got two positions for CNN Money, but we're looking for someone who can not only write, but potentially may be able to report on television. So we're looking for someone who's got multiple skill sets. Now, where do you get that? That is, that is the biggest challenge. Uh, just for, for you, it's talent. I think for me, it's leadership positions that are the hardest jobs to fill because traditionally in the news business, I think we've taken people who are really great journalists and we've made them bosses. But newsroom leadership is a very different uh, set of skills than, uh, than being a really great journalist. So. Yeah, I know how that goes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> talked about, um, Alana, you talked a little bit about finding the next, the, the Chinese Christian Amanpour. Um, and you mentioned earlier sort of what you're looking for, an attitude, an approach mm -hmm. to the job. Uh, there's a whole lot of qualities that go into a great journalist. Um, the metabolism, the attitude. I actually always look for people who are insecure um, in a good way, in the sense that, you know, you doubt yourself and you, you always consider the possibility significant that you would have made a mistake, and so you double and triple check your work and make mm -hmm. sure you get it right. And uh, I think that actually is a virtue in journalism. Um, can you talk about specific qualities, I mean, other than like being willing to get up at one in the morning, which is actually, actually, I concur with that entirely, you know, the willingness to just be there and right. do the job, but specific qualities that you, th that you all look for? Well, they'd have to write really well. I mean, you need to write. You also need to be able to go beyond the relying on your Reuters and your APs and your Bloomberg terminals. You have to have the ability to pick up the phone and double check your facts. I think, you know, we were just talking about how like CNN was in a relationship with AP and we sort of went our separate ways in a way. But what they did in a way is brought back into the newsroom the skills of, 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 the, old, of the old days of calling up and confirming your, your sources. Um, and so you need someone, you need those kind of journalists. Creativity, 
you don't want to be too creative with twos, I have to say, when you're really fact-checking and fact-basing it. But what I mean by creativity is if you have a really strong producer who's putting a rundown together for one hour, you know, we are in a really stiff competition with everybody out there. It's the same type of news that you have delivering to your audience. Well, then what extra value are we going to bring to the audience? Just because we're CNN, what is that extra X factor? And if you have a really strong producer who's going to be able to connect the strands, an instance that's happening in London, and why should we, sitting in Hong Kong, care about it? You really need someone who has to, who can have a holistic view of that news. And to so be what you're saying, just to, just to mm -hmm. drill down a little bit, so when you talk about that awareness of news, mm -hmm. um, you're looking for somebody who is widely read in, I mean, who, Very. who, who pays attention to mm -hmm. everything and who has a, an innate curiosity about everything, right? That's yep. what you're saying, really. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, you're all here, but, you know, this isn't a nine-to-five job. You know, this really is, you know, your job doesn't end when you walk out the door. So, yes, to be incredibly well read. read. And if you, ha if you can add some of your passions to that. So I have a guy, for example, who's crazy about, you know, technology and the Xbox and whatever, you know, new technology that comes. He, he's out there in Japan lining up, getting the, the latest tech gadget. That really brings a lot of value to our newsroom. Are there characteristics or personality traits you look for? Um, I guess, you know, before I even consider someone, they need to have the, the basics, right? They need to be a solid news reporter, facts good, um, pick up the phone, work hard. And I guess one of the things that differentiates uh, that I see, and it's even my reporting staff now, is I have some people who have a list of 10 stories they want to do right now, and they always have a list of 10 stories, then they never get to them. And I have other people who... Wait, is that good or bad? That's good, because... They, they never get to them? Well, <laughs> it's true, but they're working we really work hard. Together. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what we could have had. <laughs> uh, I still have my list from, from those days. So, the, no, I, I, I think it is managing the person, so, and it is, in some ways it's incumbent on the editors, but you know, I get a list of 10 ideas, you know, okay, we're going to do this one, we want to do this one, we don't want to do this one, we don't want to do this one. Um, but I want someone who keeps coming up with, hey, I heard this, I want to go dig into that, hey, you know, I think this might be really interesting. Um, I was I had a dinner the other night, and, and this guy was telling me this story. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear that stuff bubbling up. I tell my reporters that, you know, you can give me ideas or I can give you ideas. And, you know, if someone's sitting around, I'm going to give them a story idea. And, you know, the last thing they want is a story idea from me because it's, you know, it may not be any good, and they're going to have to report it out anyway because I've assigned it. But uh, I, I, uh, I want them to be generating ideas and being out there. And, and some of it's creativity, some of it's hard work. Some of it's seeing a story. I think, boy, this is interesting. I heard this nugget. I heard that nugget. I think maybe maybe there's something going on here, and I'm gonna. I want to look into it. Anything to add, Brian? Yeah, those both uh, a great set of attributes. The ones I would add, I guess, one which is fairly easy, I think, to measure in a really good job interview is just a certain measure of intellectual curiosity. People who just are really interested and curious about the world, which comes across, I think, in conversation and you know, in the kinds of travel people have done. Um, the other, which I think is really hard to measure um, when vetting a candidate, is just resourcefulness. If I drop this person onto some remote island in Indonesia after a tsunami, are they going to be able to figure out not only how to report the story, but also how to get, how to transmit their images or their story back to, uh, back to where it came from? And that is especially, um, you know, especially working in this part of the world, that's an incredibly important skill uh, that people need to have. Yeah, I, I just I think we're probably saying similar things, but you know now we're multi-platforms. You know I see the Wall Street Journal now doing more you know video type of things. You know our reporters now have they have several masters. That's the, why we actually call uh, the production side the beast because the beast is so hungry all the time. And what our reporters have to do they in the old days they just had to worry about what they do on television. Now they have to write a, a wire. Then they also have to write something for the digital side. And then they have to do interviews for the affiliates. I mean, they've got, when they're out in the story, they've got to s satisfy these various masters. So that type of flexibility and multi-skill ability is, is really, really critical for us. So one of the things um, in all these traits and attributes we're, you're talking about is what you, the bosses, are looking for from prospective hires or journalists in your newsrooms. But one of the most critical elements of success in journalism today is serving the audience. And while bosses invariably see themselves as the, as the true intermediaries of the readers or viewers will, in fact, 
the readers and viewers operate sometimes independently from bosses because we have other metrics that we are honoring. How do you think people in a newsroom, and to what degree should people in a newsroom be thinking about the metrics that show how successful you are individually as a journalist with readers or viewers? To what extent is that an issue for an individual reporter or editor or producer in a newsroom? I, I, that's been a huge challenge for us, us at the AP because we're essentially a wholesaler of news, right? I mean, a huge percentage of our of our content is distributed to other business customers, most of whom are other media organizations. So measuring and reacting to audience behavior has been difficult because we don't have a certain number of page views on our home website. That's changed a little bit. We have our own you know, presence in mobile and we're able to, to now see how stories are, are playing, but it's, you know, over time, uh, I have, and you know, a lot of AP leaders in the AP have tried to really, even though the the customer uh, is more likely to be another media organization, the end user of the content, uh, to use very corporate sounding language, uh, is is a human somewhere, um, and so to really think about how that person is uh, is looking at the story or the image or the piece of video and reacting to it, and um, and to make that the focus of the journalism as opposed to. Um, you know, the, the intermediary in our case, who is the AP client who's receiving it and then distributing it to their audience. Yeah, I think the verification process is really critical in our business. I mean, you know, and that's what I love about the digital space, uh, because you can definitely measure it very quickly. I mean, CNN International, at least globally, we don't have the Nielsen ratings as we do in the United States. So you're always trying to figure out, you know, the story that you put your money and your people on, does this have value for the, ultimately at the end consumer? I don't like to get caught up too much on that, at least in my newsroom, because ultimately good journalism is good journalism. You know, it, you know, everyone's here, they, you, know, you know what's good journalism is, so I'm not gonna go into that process, but you know when you have a home run, for, it has all the right ingredients. The beauty about the digital space that I love, and sometimes it becomes, you know, talent could be very vulnerable in this. We can see, for example, if you start watching a package, if your viewers will stick with you. Sometimes they drop off when the reporter comes on, on, on the screen, which is really unfortunate. So then we have a conversation with the reporters about, well, the, the couple of seconds that you're on, you know, doing your stand-up, how are you gonna bring your viewers in and to make them part of your story? So we have these metrics as we can see. A great story, people will stay 90%. There's a 90% completion. Some of it is 10%, and some of it is 30%. Then you can start dying, you know, diagnosing why, why would someone just bail out on my story after 40%. So yes, we do have that. I think it's a very important mechanism and to have those verification uh, mechanisms, but ultimately I think we, we all know what's a really good and strong story. It's a, a, I, I, I kind of judge it differently in different situations. So if I have a reporter who consistently delivers stories that get a lot of readership online and they're good, interesting, well-reported stories, I'm thrilled. Um, if I have a reporter covering you know, more narrow, a narrowly focused area, and I know that there's, I know it's important, but there are fewer readers, I, you know, I'll judge them on the quality uh, of the stories, and I also will think in the back of my mind, do we, how, how should we be covering this uh, the way we're covering it? Are we, you know, are we covering it uh, uh, too much given, given the audience? But I always tell a story, and I think we were together at the time, the, um, the first uh, stories we wrote on the LIBOR scandal which you know has the eye glazing effect uh, that that you you know you can't believe the first stories we wrote on the LIBOR scandal, um, which were the first really the first stories anyone was writing on it, um, got this huge readership, and we would put these stories up, you know, and they took a lot of editing and a lot of explaining, and they get these huge readership, and we're like, hmm, you know, maybe there's maybe there's something to it, and uh, and we did a lot more reporting, and I think part of the reason we did a lot more reporting was there was a huge story there, and we had a great reporter who was covering it. Part of the reason was they were consistently getting um, getting read, and so that's stuff that you think about as an editor. So talking about what you think about as an editor, um, you get hired in a news organization, things are going great, you're sufficiently willing to come in at one in the morning, you're insecure in all the right ways, <laughs> and you think maybe what you want to do next is rise up in management. Um, what's What are the issues facing managers like yourselves in news organizations today? Where do you spend your time is it something that anybody should aspire to, or should we all just avoid it like the plague because really it's just going to ruin our lives? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not projecting here. I'm just asking a question. I actually love management. 
I mean, I came up from AP and producer and all that level, and management is something I've been into a couple years now. But I actually really enjoy management because, you know, I, we go back to the 1 a.m. If you can, if, you know, trying to motivate a team 9 to 5 is not as difficult as trying to motivate a team at 1 in the morning. You have to have a lot of skill sets. For us in New York, we had to watch a lot of VH1 to make sure we're getting through the day with, you know, disco music. But, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like with management, some do it well, some don't do it well. And I don't think any, you know, it's for everybody. But in terms of management, I find it very exhilarating in, in, this, in the system that you are able to create an environment that you think or you aspire to be, to create an environment that is the best for your journalists. So they don't have to worry about the budget, that they don't have to worry about security, that they don't have to worry about who they're gonna go out in the field, but hopefully I'm pairing them up with good people. It's not easy, but if you get it right, I find that to be very um, satisfying. Yeah, I think it's in some ways analogous to the satisfaction that a coach gets from a winning team versus you exactly. know what a player gets from a winning team. It's like you're creating the environment, you're giving them the resources they need, you're you know setting the priorities, you're front loading them on the stories, you're talking about what the images are going to be, and then when it turns out, you know, in some manifestation of, of what you envisioned it to be, that in some ways to me is more satisfying than if mm -hmm. my name's at the top of the story or I'm the one standing in front of the camera because you know you're sort of taking pleasure in the success. Uh, of others and playing a key role in it, and also, um, you know, if you if you recruit and hire somebody and train that person and mentor them, and then they you know move on through the organization uh, to bigger and better things, it's also really a, a really great and satisfying thing as a manager. From my perspective, I was always one of the people with these huge story lists that I can never get done, and so if I have a team of five reporters, I can have them do all those stories, and I got <laughs> so many more stories that I wanted to get done, done. Right. And, uh, and so that was always the, the, the thing that, that, that drove me and helped me uh, in managing was, you know, just how many more stories, how many good stories can we get out there? And uh, then there's other things like budgets and hiring. And, and well, talk about, okay, let's talk about the burdens um, because they're real too. And what are they, how much of your lives do you spend on what may be important and serious parts of management, but you know, aren't what we all think of as news and journalism. How much, do, and, and how is that changing, particularly with the advent of so many new forms of competition? Um. Millennials. Hmm? Millennials. I think managing millennials is different. Um, so that's, that falls in the category of burden? It's not so much, no, it's not a burden, but it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of our time, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, Attention I, young people. You know, and I think it's something that it's, it's really exhilarating in many ways because you get to sit down and have a conversation and hear from them, I've been in this job for 72 hours. I want to move on now you know, to something else. Or I want to move to a different company. And you just, you know, you, you have to have a, be able to have an honest discussion why, you know, you don't want, you, you're not a parent. You don't want to have this, you know, you've got to walk before you run discussion. But managing that when you have a such, at least for me, I have a very young newsroom. It brings so much energy and passion, which is what I love. And then you have to manage that as well, because yes, after 72 hours, I want to do this. I want to go to news gathering. I want to go to planning. I want to go certain things. I want to be on television. How do you manage that? That I think is, you know, is is something that I think for managers we need to 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 t uh, to study or something. Whoever's going to teach us about that, I think that's really a critical part of the managing skills. Well, certainly, you know, managing, you know, managing budgets is a challenge, can be a burden. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, as many of us have watched our news organizations change and in some cases get smaller by different degrees, um, thinking about the organization and its structure and how it can function, you know, as a different sized organization with a different set of priorities, uh, it takes, a, I think, a pretty special kind of news manager to really enjoy that aspect of it because it has very little to do with reporting the news every day and, you know, editing the stories or, you know, assigning the... Uh, making the assignments, and yet, you know, again, it's, you know, the foundation on which people can then go out and do good work, so you've got to create an environment where they can do that. You know, I guess, uh, you know, we've been lucky because we, we haven't faced a lot of the cutbacks that a lot of other organizations have have had, but I think one of the things is, you know, maybe, maybe these are a, a dreamland, but in the old days, you know, you kind of had, you know, a staff, and then you had a bunch of stuff to cover, and you'd kind of rank the things you wanted to cover, 
and, and when you ran out of staff, then that's the stuff you, you didn't cover. Um, and it was a real match, you know, matching stuff. And stories change, and you re reapportion staff. And now it seems like um, there's a whole other variable, which is, you know, costs and budgets and, oh, we're going to move, you know, this money that we had for reporting over to this other project. We, we need to hire more you know, online graphics people. We, we want to hire, you know, a social media editor, and we're not going to cover this because we decided that's a priority. And so the ground is shifting on you more, and you know, that can be hard because you, you feel like, okay, now uh, there's an area that I want to cover that I'm not covering, and how can I make that work? And so you for force yourself to, okay, we'll make a compromise here. That, that's the stuff that's been, been harder more recently. Um, is money a constraining factor in terms of what you think you ought to be able to do? Either are you able to hire the people you want to hire? Do you have enough money to hire the people you want to hire? in every case, or do you ever end up being in a situation where you can't hire somebody, or do you not have the resources sometimes and have to do triage around areas that you would like to cover? Has that ever happened? Um, not really the former, but the latter to some extent. I mean, I think, um, you know, you're always going to, every story you decide to do is going to be a choice, and part of the metric you're using to make that choice is, is finances, you know? If, if you have a uh, you know, if you have a pool of resources and you have to decide, okay, how are we going to cover, you know, this vast and fascinating region with an endless number of stories um, with the resources that we have, then you're not only deciding what you're going to do, but you're also deciding what you're not going to do. And in some cases, what you're deciding not to do, to Ken's point, is stuff that you've always done. Um, but you're not doing it because, you know, the landscape's changing, the audience is changing, the, you know, the customers are changing, uh, and you need to change along with that. And, uh, you know, I think the one thing about managing change is that, you know, it doesn't stop changing just because you made a decision last year uh, to hire a data journalist instead of, you know, another correspondent in Indonesia. Um, you're going you're gonna to have to make another decision like that this year, and you're going to have to look back at those decisions you made in past years and, you know, and, and wonder if that's still the right, uh, the right mix. I mean, I've always made those decisions. There have always been people I want to hire that cost a, a fortune, and I'm not going to get, even in the good times, uh, I'm not going to get that fortune. Um, or I, I want, I feel like there's an area we need to cover and not everyone necessarily agrees with me. So uh, it's always been the case. And I think probably now it's just, I think it's just things shift more frequently. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant juggling act. If you find really good talent, I would say we, we would go after them. Um, but it's a, it's a daily juggling act. You know, I was on the way from, you know, from my home coming here and I basically had to ask my editor, it's a good story, but is it's a nice to have story, but is it a must? You know, when I've got, you know, budget concern, I've got to think of budgets. And you don't want to dampen the team that's, exp you know, worked on that story, but I have to constantly ask myself, what's the difference of a nice to have and a must? And, you know, we are uh, a global network. We've got bureaus all over the world. So, you know, we're not, we're not always adding new bureaus, and you've always got to have, you know, where do you add, where do you take away? So it, it is a constant struggle. Hopefully, you know, you have a strategy behind it and you are able to see for the next three, five years where is it that you ultimately have to be based and where is it that you don't have to have, you know, foot soldiers on the ground, but you can work in different ways. We are very lucky in the sense that we've got a bouquet of affiliates around the world. So certain, sometimes when we're not physically there, we can rely on some of the key uh, television providers in that country. So you have to be a bit creative that way. Technology certainly helps us. I mean, we, you know, we're a, journal, we're a journalism company, but we are also a technology company that allows us to do what we want to do from all parts of the world because we've got great technicians who allow us to do that in a cheaper way. And so, it, yeah, it's a, it's a constant juggle. So let me open up the questioning to the rest of you because you're all journalists in one way or another and probably have better questions than I do anyway. So. Um, Somewhere there's a microphone, and if there's not, why don't you just stand up and, oh, here's the microphone. Um, we have one here. Please say who you are so we know. Hi, I'm Annie, and I work um, at Reuters in Thailand. Um, my question is for anyone. Um, how do you handle, as a team leader, as a manager, how do you handle weak talent? Like you said, it takes what, 72 hours to know if you hired the wrong person, but it doesn't take 72 hours to get rid of them. So how do you work with that? How do you manage and motivate them to become a, a leader or to at least be stronger? You know, I'll just, from my personal experience, it, you have to be honest. 
and feedback is very important. I think one of the things managers don't do very well is give feedback. It's really tough. You know, managers don't want to be bad people. They want to always deliver good news if you, if you potentially can because you're human beings at the end of the day and you do want to be liked. But feedback really, if you give it in a constructive way, you know, for me, it's always, it's a wrong, it's, we have annual reviews, we have mid-year reviews, and that's another part that takes a lot of my time. I think at the end of that, if an employee feels that what, you, what they're hearing from you in December is a surprise to them, I think at some point that I failed that employee. You know, it has to be a constant conversation throughout the year when they're not only doing, you know, they're not measuring up, but also when they're doing really well. But sometimes we forget, we're 24 hour, we're very fast, and we kind of forget to pause and say, hey, you know what? You did a really great job on that. Or you know what? Something was missing. What was it that was missing? And so it really goes to feedback. And sometimes you, you, can, you're, you can have feedback for a short period of time. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. For, you know, for a young reporter um, and someone I've hired, you know, maybe with language skills or, or various things, you know, you, you try to work with them, try to work with them. Maybe this approach didn't work. Maybe that approach, you know, help really work with, set them up with a senior reporter and do, t uh, you know, stories together. Um, maybe they're uh, better uh, doing short, you know, really short, you know, new, more newswire type stories and do, have them do that for you, try a lot of things. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and uh, for a more senior person, um, you know, it's trickier. And, and usually what it is is, um, Someone comes in, you know, they've done great work. Um, they really are a pro, and they don't, they just don't fit into what you want. You've, you've made a mistake, and, and they have a certain way of working, and it's not the, our way of working, or they're, they're, they have certain assumptions, and, and we're not delivering on the assumptions, whatever. And that, you know, usually you just have to end it. You just have to be very clear, and it doesn't happen in a day, but it, it, it's, you, those, are, those are situations that are hard to, to work out. With other people, it's much easier to really try to work through and, and teach them and, and all that. The only thing I would add is, you know, you, you do have to, there is a certain level of patience. You have to give people time to adjust to the different workflow of different organizations. And you have to be really clear about what your expectations are for that person, both before you hire them and, you know, continually after you hire them um, so that they know what's expected of them. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. And sometimes it's better to determine that faster rather than, you know, to let it, to let it fester for too long. Other questions? People who've been in a company for a very long time and they work really hard and they're really dependable. But what separate the dependable good workers to leaders? You know, there, there are things that people do inherently kind of screw them out of a promotion that is not really talk about as much. Could you share some light? <laughs> <laughs> is there a specific example, Paul, that you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, you want your newsroom leaders to be great journalists, but it doesn't mean that all great journalists are great newsroom leaders. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, somebody has been in a job for a long time because they're really good at that job and there's nothing wrong with having a career, you know, um, doing a certain thing. And I think, um, you know, we've made the mistake in the past of assuming because somebody breaks news all over the place or, you know, is a you know, great producer uh, that they're automatically going to be a great boss. And that's not always the case because being a boss is about a lot more than just the content end of it, you know? It's about creating an environment where people want to come to work every day. And it's about, you know, having the people who work around and under you continue to develop as journalists themselves. And, you know, and uh, you know, some people are good at that and some people, you know, are good about writing stories. And, you know, um, that doesn't mean they can't to continue to develop and get better at that function of their job, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the right person for that promotion. If I could just sound like a swivel-eyed optimist for a second. Um, my experience has been that people who do good work and want to rise will rise. That generally speaking, I don't, you know, there was sort of implicit in there the notion that you could be doing great work and, you know, the bosses will keep overlooking you. I think most news organizations are pretty meritocratic and particularly today when, they're, when the resources are limited, bosses look for people who are skilled and they look for people who are good at journalism and if you're good, if you're if you're a writer and you're producing, you're writing really great stuff consistently, you're going to get attention from the boss. And then if you are a manager and you're doing a good job managing the enterprise, 
your department, whatever, you're going to get more attention. I do think that, you know, that what happens where people may go wrong is they become too focused on the career aspect and not don't remain focused enough on the what are you supposed to do aspect. And I do think, and again, I, I may be wildly optimistic here, I do think that in general, if people are consistently doing good work and focused and delivering, I think most news organizations are meritocratic enough that they will promote you. Well, they're meritocratic and desperate enough that they will promote people who are good. <laughs> I think in, in uh, one of the, the differentiating factors in a manager, you know, I will, I will take, if I have a great reporter who's, you know, a real pain in the behind, that's fine. You know, I mean, I have to deal with them, um, but they're producing great stuff. And uh, I will, you know, manage that, and 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 the end result is 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 what I want. But uh, they're not uh, someone who's going to be a manager. And so, you know, you hate to say attitude, and you know, you, it's, it's sort of such a nebulous thing. But you know, to get to that, to to be promoted and moved up and put in charge of people, you know, that's often a differentiating factor for someone who's good. Hi, my name is Yu Gang. Um, I cover technology for the Associated Press in Seoul. Um, my question is about growing number of journalists who are from their local, from their country, and are fluent in English or educated in the United States, who con continue to um, increasingly contribute to Western media, where you guys are from. Um, I would like to hear from each of you, uh, as a news manager, what kind of benefits do you think these people? contribute to your newsroom and uh, do, you, do you try to balance people uh, when you hire, do you try to balance people from the local country before fluent in English and people who are probably educated, grow up in the US but have knowledge about Asia? And uh, I would like to hear about what kind of strength and weakness do you see in, those, uh, in these candidates because I think Asia is a really interesting place in that sense. A lot of you know, Asian people are interested in working for the Western media. Um. You know, news is, all, is always local. So that's why, you know, we don't even dare to compete against local news. Uh, so it's very advantageous for us to find someone in that country who's living and breathing the news there. So we are always looking for that. The flip side of that is sometimes you could be too local. So we're looking for someone who can tell us why that story is not only important for you're coming from South Korea, for the South Korean market, but why the person in Spain is going to care about that. So we need someone who's going to be able to articulate that to us as we have pitches coming from all over the world and demanding space on a 24-hour news channel. So that's one aspect of it. We are constantly looking for someone who's multi-language multi skill, which is very important, and especially when we're dealing with stories like North Korea. It is helpful for us to have someone who speaks you know, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and English. But ultimately, we need people who are going to be able to write really well. And so they have to be very strong in their English skills in terms of, in terms of their um, speaking skills, but also their writing skills. Sometimes we find people who can speak very well, but may not be able to write very well in English. So that would be, that would be the, d the difficulty uh, of that. Uh, but we are definitely always looking for someone who can uh, come from multiple countries. It just makes us stronger as an organization. Uh, I would say that balance that you mentioned, Yu Kyung, is essential that you have people, you know, who look at a country from an outside perspective, but also people who who have deep knowledge and connections from within the country. I think what's changed over the past generation is the level of training and skill in journalism in every country in Asia um, amongst um, people from that country is, is much, much higher, and it's because there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of great opportunities for journalism education in Asia, and there are a lot of people like yourself who um, have you know, gone to university in the US and then gone back to their home country. And I really think you know, people like you and your colleagues are a huge part of the future of news gathering, at least in the agency business in, in Asia, because um, the level of skill and training is so much higher than it's been in the past, and because it's such an invaluable part of understanding a country and then translating that country for the rest of the world. You know, I think it, we're at an interesting time. So we, we publish now in Asia online, we publish in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Hindi, and Bahasa. Um, and so English language is, of course, hugely important, but we have a lot more flexibility and we're serving different audiences, so we actually compete with local media. Um, and you know, I'll give an example. Um, 
we have uh, in, in India, we have you know uh, some you know non-Indians working for us, but a very small number. And then we have a mostly our, the bureau is probably 90 percent um, Indians, and it's the Dow Jones Newswires Bureau and it's the Wall Street Journal Bureau, which is all together. And uh, the bureau chief there had done uh, a bunch of projects, investigative reports, and long features over the past few years with a bunch of the different staff members and really got them trained to do high quality work. When the, um, uh, that rape case last December in Delhi happened, um, we had a bunch of really well trained um, reporters who knew the country and it turns out that um, uh, one of the reporters, uh, one of our you know, sort of young uh, local reporters was from the same town as someone who was involved in this and, uh, and had spoke the local language um, and we were able to get um, several big scoops, global scoops uh, on the local media and everything, some of which landed on our front page um, on that story. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see more of and it's incumbent on us to train people um, who are uh, talented and passionate and, and then get them to the level of uh, skill and, and the reporting skill and the writing skill that we that we want that work for a global news organization. So I, I think we are at a re really interesting time. It's, it's gotten so much better. You know, I came to Hong Kong the first time in 1984 and worked for Dow Jones, AP Dow Jones News Service. We had four people in Asia, two in Tokyo, one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore. How many people do you have now, sort of Dow Jones Empire in Asia? About 200. About 200. So it's been some increase. And <laughs> the, the quality of the people is vastly superior. The depth of the reporting is vastly superior. And 19, you, know, I, you hear one of the things that drives me a little bonkers is I will sometimes read or hear about the demise of a foreign correspondent. And you'll, they'll have whole like <laughs> books and panels and committees talking about the decline of the foreign Glory correspondent. Days. And I mean, you know, the technical term for that is colossal bullshit. There are, <laughs> there are far more people today doing really good reporting from all of these countries than ever before. I mean, if you asked in, 19, in 1980, if you wanted to know what's going on in the petrochemical industry in China, you went to the Jesuits who were, Ying Chan, where were the Jesuits? They were out in Chinese university or something. Then they, they had this study group and they, these Jesuits who'd come out of China, they'd go into to the railroad station in Guangdong, look at the grease on the axle and try and figure out what the petrochemical industry was up to in China. You know, the knowledge today is so much better and it's because the journalists are from the, these places and really know what they're talking about and because they can be in there and the news organizations are hiring them. The challenge for the news organizations now, and I think the, that there is real progress at some and there's less progress at others, is to view all the journalists as journalists and there is still tiering that goes on inside some organizations and they look at the people who are hired locally and they, their treatment of them is different and you know invariably what will happen is and it does happen is somebody who's really just awesome great and happens to come from you know KL but is just driving a lot of traffic that person is going to start having economic leverage and one of the beauties of all the metrics that are available today is you know who works you know who's powerful and who's and and those journalists need to go back to their employers and start you know demanding and they'll, they'll there'll be a lot more of that but I still sense in some places just from what I read that there is this hierarchy in some places enforced like in China because the government won't let people have bylines in other places I think cultural but it's going to change that uh, yeah I mean I was going to Say a version of the same thing, though not as eloquently. Um, oh, no. But, <laughs> but I think uh, one of the I, I think one of the things to think about that I think probably applies to a fair number of people in this room is if you're hired by a Western news organization in your home country, even if you're educated, you know, in the U.S. or the U.K. or in a you know in a third country, um, I really think as a as a career step, moving and working from another country other than your home country, and as news organizations, we need to create opportunities for people to advance without only advancing within their country. Because if you work, you know, if you if you work for the AP in India or, or South Korea or most places, there's you know there's this, you're going to hit the ceiling fairly quickly. There's not dozens or hundreds of jobs in these places, but there are opportunities for advancement all around the world. And if you can do it, um, you know, with your family life and you know all the other factors we consider when thinking about moving to another country, I think it's definitely uh, a beneficial thing for a lot of people who have done it. Yeah, we had. I took a, 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 one of our Chinese researchers a few years ago uh, to New York. She covered commodities for me, and it was fantastic because she, 
China was driving commodities, and so she gave us a great, this great perspective in New York um, doing that. I have a, a Japanese reporter in Hong Kong now uh, covering tech, um, and that's great because he's seeing a very, getting a very different view. He had covered Japanese technology for you know five or ten years, and he was incredibly knowledgeable. And now we're th he's you know he spent a, a week not that long ago on the Alibaba campus, um, you know, so that. That's an interesting mix of, of uh, experiences. In the back, in the red. Hi, uh, my name is Rex Mai. I'm, uh, I'm from, actually, I'm from Cambodia, and I just finished up my study at Hong Kong Baptist University. And my question to uh, all of you is, uh, we would like to know, have you ever uh, faced any difficulties to cope with your reporter using uh, uh, social media like Facebook or Twitter? You know, like they, they sometimes they uh, give comments, blah, blah, blah. And because back in Cambodia, many people, uh, like many journalists, they don't know who they are. They're just commenting what they want to, to say. So I would like to, to know your comment on that. And my second question is that uh, regarding the recruitment, I would like to ask this question to Mr. <laughs> CNN. I like your speech. Uh, will you? <laughs> yeah, I like your quote. Like I can't teach you the AP style and Ajajira style, but I can't teach you the attitude. But my question is that: Will you uh, welcome the young graduate like us? Because many of us come here, and or you look back into the like professional experience, something like oh, where, do, where we are come from, something like that. Thank you so much. What was the second question? Could you start? Could yep. you repeat the second question? The second question is, will you welcome the young graduate like, or you, do you care about a degree, master, bachelor degree, and, and you look into the uh, professional experience or not? Yeah. Absolutely, we look at d professional experience. I mean, degree is helpful, but I don't know, you know, uh, GPAs, you know, it doesn't Hong really... Hong Kong University <laughs> degrees though, right? Huh? Really, Hong Kong University degree. Yeah. Hong Kong Baptist. Yeah. Yeah, Hong Kong Baptist. Yeah, absolutely. You know, university degree, um, journalism degree, although, you know, when, as soon as I stepped foot in a journalism school, I found out anybody who was famous never went to journalism school. So I was like wondering why I was there. Um, but, you know, I, I get it. You know, 10 years on, everybody has a degree. So, yes, that helps. But I think the professional experience is very helpful. You know, we do background checks in terms of we get references and it's very good when you know someone's working at other professional organizations and they come highly recommended. We definitely look at all, all those aspects. We do writing tests. We, we do all the basics that all my colleagues would probably do as well. So yes, in, that, in, in those terms, you know, we, we definitely look at all those things. Um, your first question was about uh, social media. Social media. Yes, it keeps our PR department, and we have a PR department here, really quite busy. Uh, but for for us, we have uh, we have standards and practices which we uh, which we uh, we give to all of our reporters, producers, writers, just everybody in the world of CNN. You have to read it, and we have strict guidelines. Basically, if you have CNN name attached to it, there are no personal opinions, and we need we tell that to our staff. We even tell that to our Sorry, interns. Can you clarify that? If you have a CNN name attached to you, in other words, if you work for CNN, mm -hmm. you can't you can't go period, out. Or is it if the, if your Twitter handle is CNN Ken? If it's CNN Ken, you have to you have to stick to the reporting standards and practices. But what if he's actually he works for you, but his Twitter handle is, you know, Wall Street Journal? No, his name is it just goes by his name. Does it? Even though, you know, we, we believe that you can have your private Facebook where you, you know, limit it and lock it to your friends. And you know, whatever you do in that space, it's, it's your business. But if you are uh, putting things on there and that you are in a capacity as a reporter, you know, there is no different. You are, you know, you have to be a reporter and there are standards and practice of that. What all the checks and balances we would do f before you get your script on air is still the same thing as social media. Somehow, People think social media just gives you the license to say whatever you want or, you know, have one verification and still get on it. And it's, it's not the case. It would, we would still be, we would still be obliged. You know, they would still say, how did you check your facts? And so it, we make sure that whenever we're dealing with social media that everyone reads it and they make sure that they verify that they read all the social guidelines.
Hi, I, I want to go back to the question about uh, firing people. Um, when you interview someone, you oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Michael uh, Logan from Next Media Animation, and uh, we just hired a bunch of people um, <laughs> uh, about two dozen. And I, um, but anyway, I, I wanted. What is it like uh, when you're about to fire someone? You're thinking back. <laughs> about the interview process, like uh, what did I miss in the interview, in the three interviews, uh, uh, to where I, I didn't see it, but now I see it, um, and I have to go back and, and correct my mistake. Uh, was there anything in the interview that you overlooked, or in retrospect, you were like, oh, I should have seen that. Um, but conversely, um, have you ever come across somebody that you passed on and you wish you didn't? And uh, you know, uh, in retrospect, what did, what did you miss about them? Um, I've only I've only fired one person I hired, and 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 he signed off on that person too. So uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> and the mistake I made was that person had worked at an organization that had a very particular culture and a very particular product for a long, long time, and I was asking them to do something different. And, uh, I th and they had the skills were there, and the attitude was there, and all that stuff, and they never adapted. They never quite made that transition. And so I don't think I made a mistake. I mean, I think I, was ta I, I knew what we needed, and, and the person wasn't able to, to do that. And it you know, probably took probably less than a year. Um, and they were surprised when they were fired, but they shouldn't have been because they had been consistent you know, questioning of what um, – uh, what they were doing, um, and the second part was. When you get reversed. Oh yeah. Um, no, I, I. It's it's always been a situation of you know either we don't have the right job or we can't afford them. That that. That doesn't mean you don't regret it. I mean. Yeah yeah no that's right oh yeah no there's people I wish we could have hired sure absolutely. Funny, I just on the on the first question since I signed off on that. Topic, <laughs> Um, I think Ilana's, Ilana's point earlier was a really important one, which is, you know, it's, it's vital to be upfront with people about your reasoning and to take on full culpability for your own lapses and just sort of acknowledge that, you know, we thought it was going to be great and then proceed to enumerate all the reasons why and put the emphasis on why it, why it should have been great and then say, you know, Sadly, it doesn't seem to be working, and, and here's why. I mean, I think it happens. It's actually happening more than once, and it, it will happen in any organization because of cultural differences. You know, I've seen people hired in who they're, they come in under sort of one family circumstance, and then there's some disruption in their family, and, and they're less interested in the job. I mean, there's a whole host, the range of reasons, and all that matters is you know, clarity and transparency, honesty, and the maximum amount of uh, sympathy, if not empathy, with the person to ensure that they feel not wronged by you because, after all, you made a choice and you need to acknowledge that you made a choice, but, you know, everybody makes mistakes at some point or another. And then the list of people that I wish I had hired and that, who later went to work somewhere else and became huge stars <laughs> is, like, everybody in this room. <laughs> I, 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 this person was not fired, but I can think of an example in which someone interviewed so incredibly well that I sort of skipped all of the other things that you're supposed to do in order to uh, vet a candidate. You know, talking to their colleagues and you know, trying you know, trying to suss out as many things about them as you can outside the interview process. And you know, I sort of wish I had hired everyone else I interviewed for that job. <laughs> yeah, I, f I could. I, I, I know exactly what you guys are talking about. Um, but what I do when I hire someone, in the beginning, I may have hired someone based on an interview I did with that individual. I no longer do single interviews. If I'm gonna hire a position, like I hire someone for the international desk, I will have, ev I will have a pretty good group of people interview that person. So that person is gonna go through two, three different interview process with us. The, back, the bad side of it, it takes a while because, you know, trying to get all our schedules in place and to meet this individual. But I want them to be a stakeholder 
into this new person we are hiring. So when something goes wrong, they are also invested into making sure that person is supported properly. And so for me, one of the things I learned from, you know, someone, I take it from the book from some another manager is, I will have other people interview the individual and reconfirm and confirm what I feel, or sometimes they'll tell me, look, I know you, why you like this individual, but for these are the reasons why it won't fit at this time and stage in their development. So that's what I do, and hopefully that's helped us make less mistakes, but you know, I've been in those very, very tricky and sticky positions where you've had to, yeah, say, you know, give some unfortunate news. Okay, thank you, Zenya. Um, I'm Yi Xiang. Um, previously, I worked with the Thomson Reuters as a financial reporter. So I have got three questions I want to ask the panel. Um, the first one is about, because right now a lot of organizations are coming through the internal business restructuring. So the reporters, after they have been uh, made redundant, then they go outside, maybe they still applying for a reporter role, but they might end up into PR or maybe marketing or maybe into finance. Yes, yeah, so, so I wonder, so do you still welcome in this type of people that are coming back to journalism? Because they might still got the passion, just at these circumstances, they might not find a suitable role. Yes, yeah, so how do you perceive that? What type of industry you think probably would be linked then back to the industry, the journalism industry? Then the second question is about the CFA, because I know a lot of financial reporters that are, doing, that are taking that type of uh, examination. So you, you think how important it is for them to take that of financial, financial certificate, bring that background into journalism? Then my third question, um, is related to, because I know there are some reporters, for example, they're working for your money, or maybe they're working for incisive media, so they're reporting on very specific, very specific type of journalism. Mm, so that is a very niche market. But this type of people, they still, they also wanted to go to the uh, wider media, so they want to go to the, like, a wire service. So you think, how can they switch their skills? from reporting a lynch market into a wire service reporter. Thank you. Usually, um, our journalists who go to finance uh, won't come back because the salary is so different. <laughs> 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 right. yeah. Well, but you guys will have a better I came answer. back. <laughs> <laughs> I, Yay. I, qu I quit. No, I didn't make a fortune. <laughs> quit on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I quit on Marcus uh, and spent um, 20 months at an investment management firm uh, uh, because something I'd always wanted to do and they were sources of my, I'd known them for years, they had been sources of mine for years and they had kept wanting me to come over and I actually quit twice. I quit once and I stayed and then I quit again and really left and, um, and I, missed, I missed journalism, I missed the paper um, and, uh, and I came back. and. Uh, you know, I left on good terms. I mean, they knew I was sort of passionate about it. So uh, um, that's one. Two, uh, CFA. Uh, I've met some really good reporters who have CFAs, and it helps them uh, understand finances and stuff. I have some really good reporters who are equally good on finances who never did a CFA. And I, I actually think if you need that kind of education or that kind of uh, training um, to learn this stuff, that's fine. Uh, other folks have learned it on their own. Uh, I, you know. I think once you get really deep into that stuff, it really doesn't play out in mainstream, you know, even, even our type of journalism, it's too specific. Um, and the last was uh, niche publications. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't tend to hire from them, um, partially because you can see, the only people I would consider hiring would be people who really generate a lot of scoops, you know, who really are, are driving that, that space. The problem is, I don't know it's hard to say that that would translate into a broader uh, field. And also, my experience with some of those is they don't operate the same way we do in terms of sourcing, in terms of you know the quality of the information, in terms of you know um, I can think of a bunch of them who uh, who get a lot of scoops and you know a third or so are wrong um, because of the way they report. And I think they have value in the field they're in, but it wouldn't work for us. So I, it's kind of hard. Okay, we have one type one more question because I overlooked you. Why don't you do? Up behind you. There. Yes, thank you. 
Hello, I'm Angela and I'm an independent reporter and filmmaker based in Beijing, ma working mainly with the Wall Street Journal over the last two years. And my question is about um, uh, the status of freelance journalism, uh, assuming that freelancers have the skills and talent and are savvy about what you want, whether it's at the journal AP or CNN, um, what objectively uh, do you see as the role of freelancers both now and into the future here in Asia? Well, I we use a lot of freelancers, uh, you know, for all formats: f photographers, video journalists, writers, and reporters. But like everything else, you know, you're you're balancing uh, a budget, and you know, you have limited resources, and you have to make choices about where and when you're going to use people. And uh, you know, I think uh, it would be nice to be able to use freelancers more often. I think one of the calculuses we use um, in deciding whether to use a freelancer is if this person is in a place where we don't have our own people. Um, so we tend to use people more often in places where we don't have, uh, you know, large bureaus of our own. In China, I mean, it's a particular challenge because of the accreditation factor. I mean, you know, we only use we only use freelancers who are who are legal. Um, but you know, I think that the use of freelancers has steadily grown, particularly for visual formats for photos and video, and I would expect that to keep keep growing probably steadily. Anything more? Yeah, I mean, freelancers are sometimes like the unsung heroes. You know, we have to tap into them in areas we don't have uh, presence. But at the same time, I'd say with, it's a matter of trust. Uh, just because they're freelancers doesn't mean that, you know, they're not exposed to our standards and practices. So we tend to continue to use freelancers that we've trust worked with us for years and years, so who know exactly what we're looking for. Because at the end of the day, if your byline's going on CNN, no one, it doesn't matter whether you're a freelancer or not. Uh, you're just you're you're part of our you're, you're part of our, our our DNA. So yes, they're incredibly important, uh, but we don't have a lot of them. We we tend to go to the ones that we've had a long history with. Um, I've been signaled we should end it here. So I just want to thank our panel. They're very helpful. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm a lurker. I'm a, I am, I'm a lurker too, so. I'm just B. Carvalano, so first initial, last name. If you can figure out how to spell my last name. <laughs> it's uh, Ken Brown 12, because there's a lot of Ken Browns out there. <laughs> You're the 12th one to join Twitter. I just want to thank the panelists again for taking the time to really quickly.